Hello and welcome to Real Vision Crypto and the Defiance Weekly Crypto Show. We are mining the fertile seam twixt TradFi and DeFi with the very sharpest of tools. And talking of sharp tools, today we're joined once again by Real Vision cryptocurrency producer Elaine Lee and the newly minted movie mogul that also goes by the name of Camilla Russo. I am Robert <laughs> Schmidt, the Admiral of Audiovisual at the Good Ship Defiant. And we have so much to talk about this week. Uh, Cami, what's on your radar? I've spotted the Bank of International Settlements, but also six luminaries of the cryptocurrency space testifying in front of Congress very, very soon. What's your take on this regulation story, the headwinds that are in front of us right now? Well, I think it's it's a great opportunity for crypto um, as an industry to get its kind of views heard um, in front of Congress. Um, you know, people testifying are uh, the kind of leaders of some of the uh, biggest stable coins. So we've obviously a lot of uh, regulatory pressure is on stable coins because of the apparent risk uh, they might hold to the traditional banking system. So, you know, Jeremy Allaire of um, Circle, which is behind the USDC, uh, will be testifying. Uh, Chad Cascarilla of Paxos, another stable coin. Um, and so, you know, I think it, it, it's a great opportunity uh, that, you know, this, this group of people will pose to Congress uh, the benefits of stable coins and, and crypto and hopefully outweigh the threat that some lawmakers may be seeing in crypto. Elena, are there any names in that list that jumped out at you? Were there particular people that you were surprised to see omitted in the list? Um, not really. And I expect Sam Bankman Fried of um, CEO of FTX to definitely make an appearance there. It's that whole moment of the congressional hearing, you know, when you see these big tech leaders from before, like Mark Zuckerberg sitting in the hot seat, Jack Dorsey in the hot seat. But now you're seeing these crypto leaders in that hot seat. And um, I know you mentioned a couple of names, but the six people are Jeremy Allaire, CEO of Circle, Sam Bankman, free CEO of FTX, Brian Brooks, CEO of Bitfury, Chad Cass Carilla, CEO of Paxos, Daniel Dixon, CEO of Stellar Development Foundation, and Alessia Haas from CEO of Coinbase and CFO of Coinbase Global. Um, so they're going to be sitting in front of committee's chairwoman, uh, Representative Maxine Waters of California, and they're just going to be answering, um, so to speak, some of the questions that they'll face is what are the right balance between regulation and innovation? How can we ensure that the promise of a new crypto economy is shared by all? And how can we ensure that consumers are protected and bad actors are foiled? So these are the sort of things that's um, going to be happening right now. I think the hearing starts at 10 a Eastern. Yeah, there's a there's an interesting figure in there, Brian Brooks, um, who was the former acting controller of the currency, and it, he used that position to allow banks to make payments in stablecoins. And I think if you take a step back from all the politics and all the the regulatory kind of shenanigans that are going on, I think basically on on a purely kind of tech level, banks would probably welcome stablecoins. And there's a lot that that can be gained from adopting them. But of course, we have to go through this regulation theater and this um, congressional theater in order to make everyone feel like they've had their say and had their piece heard about the warning. And I feel that like there's a lot of ass covering going on here, that there's like we need to have the contrarian view heard just so that if in case it all blows up, that I was the voice that said there was something going on here and I was right. Do you get that impression? It's 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 difficult as a European to look at this and and not be slightly scornful of the whole thing. I'm I'm not sure if it's really ass covering or not. I, I feel like there's just like this inherent uh, skepticism from regulators and from the, the traditional financial industry to crypto because it's new and scary. It's something that they can't easily control. So. Um, maybe it is a, a bit of like, okay, I, I, I was there before this happened and um, like the chances to say I told you so, but I think it's it's more uh, just like genuine concern about kind of crypto coming and the taking over the US dollar as a reserve currency and making uh, suddenly kind of banks obsolete. Uh, I think that's a real kind of threat that uh, you know, the incumbents are, are seeing. So um, I think they want to assess how how real 
uh, that risk is. Um, and hopefully, you know, this this group of crypto uh, luminaries can appease them um, and and show them that crypto can can be a good complement to the traditional if, uh, financial system and that it can bring uh, a lot more good than uh, than bad um, to people. Yeah. Elaine, what's your take on this? Yeah, I think ultimately it's just really just to say crypto is not going to go anywhere. I think that's what we can actually, you know, have that definitively as an answer. And then also just really putting the crypto conversation in front of, you know, policy and decision makers and really challenge the the rule of law and, you know, the world's biggest democracy. Because I just feel um, I was listening to Sam Bankman fried a, a while back and you know, every day these leaders of these organizations are spending actually a couple of hours every day on rules and regulations. And I think the whole industry is just so starved for clarity. And I think it's just only going to, you know, keep going um, straight and over to over to 2022. Well, it's interesting that you say crypto, because I feel that that's this sort of catch all term for for what we're in. But it, actually, th there's more nuance that's required there. DeFi sort of refuses to sit in the traditional conversation around crypto. And you can see in the way that it's being kind of brought to the top of the list when it comes to regulating crypto, should I call it that? Like cryptocurrencies, stable coins you. don't really yeah. fit in that conversation. And they are they see stable coins as, as as requiring more urgent action than everything else. We we had a the the Bank for International Settlements has released its quarterly report um just a couple of days ago very strong language in regards to what it believes to be the illusion of DeFi, calling you know decentralization a, a meme essentially and saying that what presents itself as decentralized finance in fact is nothing of the sort okay. and if you look at it i can see that that might well be the case but we're actually we have to recognize that decentralization is a sliding scale and it's also a process you don't just start off decentralized you have to start from a bootstrapping phase and that moves you into a phase where you can genuinely decentralize so it's an unfair kind of snapshot to take of this but wow there's some strong language in there um but of course maybe that's what's required at this stage they say literally defi's decentralization is an illusion um, DeFi appears to be operating largely within its own ecosystem with little in the way of financial intermediation services being provided to the real economy. And the big risk around stablecoins is, of course, this illusion of a bank run that suddenly there'll just be no cash when you need it. Everything's a liquid. Camilla, we've heard this argument a lot, but does this change anything, you know, with the Bank of International Settlements coming out with this report? Or is it really just, you know, as you were in terms of meeting these regulatory headwinds? You know, I, I I don't think it's it's entirely surprising. I mean, look at who the Bank of International Settlement is. It is an organization of central banks. You know, it's it's kind of the very thing that DeFi and cryptocurrencies can disrupt. So of course they're going to come in full force and say no, no, like this is dangerous. It needs to be regulated. Um, they're kind of at the biggest kind of like perceived threat of this intermediation. I honestly don't think that uh, central banks are at risk here. I think other financial institutions are, are at larger risks uh, from uh, cryptocurrencies. But I understand that central bankers, if, from at least like the interactions um, and opinions I've heard, for some reason, central bankers are just like the most anti-crypto uh, human beings on the planet. They just like cannot wrap their heads um, around it. and. You know something about this like math-based system that issues currency and, and and that it's all kind of regulated by a free market central banks are the opposite they're entities that decide how and when and at what rate currency is is issued they set rates uh to control the flow and and the demand um and offer of of currency um so it's it's pretty much the opposite of crypto so kind of i get why central bankers would be so on edge uh, about this whole system so of course like the bis uh, will come out with with a report um on, on these lines but again like i don't see crypto uh, doing away with national currencies uh i i see 
DeFi and, and, and cryptocurrencies, again, as, as um, a, a complement to national currencies and making the financial system um, and uh, the <clears throat> money, um, uh, you know, using money in, uh, more efficiently. Um, but anyways, they, they do feel threatened and they do think that uh, DeFi needs to be regulated. Um, I think like an, an interesting concept that was in the report is that they they uh, labeled uh, DeFi um, and DeFi entities as non-bank financial intermediaries. So that was kind of, you know, a way of saying these are intermediaries, but they're not banks, you know, which is a weird way of looking at it. I mean, if you think smart contracts uh, are enabling, you know, smart contracts enabling the transfer of um, value peer to peer. If you think those are intermediaries, sure, I guess. Uh, but I mean, there's no way you can really um, truthfully kind of equate that to like a bank which holds custody of your funds to a smart contract where the user is holding custody of, of their own funds. So I, I, I think that, that was a bit, if not this ingenious, at, at, at least uh, reflecting that not like a, a, a full understanding of, of DeFi. I've spent a lot of time in my life kind of acquiring skills, which five years down the line are suddenly achievable by teenagers with an iPhone. This seems to be happening in finance. And that was for the longest time, not the case. You did a certain degree and you did a certain education and you went up through a system that was very carefully planned out and plotted out and everyone looked like you and talked the same way. This is not happening anymore. The other thing that I think is really interesting is that all of these things are being flagged up as evidence of long periods of research and documentation. The problem with DeFi is that it will take something you've said and it will fix it in about 48 hours. There's this hacking mentality of just taking an idea, taking a problem and then solving it. Like, and just going, hey, listen, you had this problem, now we've solved it. And there's so much intellectual capacity ready to come and actually solve problems. So rather than saying, this is a problem, we need to regulate it and toughen up. Actually, if you tapped into the incredible innovative power of this community, you would actually be able to say, well, we have these problems. Can you help us fix them? And let's do it together. That would be an incredibly healthy and powerful conversation to have. But we're somehow positioned in opposition to each other. And I really don't think that's very helpful. But somehow it's this, oh, are you okay, boomer? And like we're Gen Alpha, Gen Z, and everything else. But it's, it's it's ridiculous. It's just who's smart, and who wants to say something. Camilla wants to say something. It's over to you. Yeah, I was just remembering that I was in a panel with Brian Brooks um, pretty recently, and his take on regulation is very similar to what you are just now saying, Robin. Because he was saying, yes, like crypto does need regulation, but why should um, why should this new system use regulation in the way that it's always been used? Rather, let's use this new technology and and use its tools to achieve the end goal that um, different regulations are 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 looking for, um, without having to use kind of the outdated methods that regulators were using to get there. So, like a more concrete example. Um, uh, money laundering rules. The way that regulators, uh, like the method that regulators use to uh, prevent um, money laundering is doing KYC. So uh, requiring, um, you know, uh, financial institutions to hand over information and collect information uh, from, from their users. Uh, but uh, Brian was, um, was arguing, why not use blockchain technology to, um, to, to compile that information without requiring KYC? Like we have like all the transaction history and we can have kind of wallets that are flagged as suspicious and we can use kind of chain analysis to flag kind of suspicious transactions and, and suspicious addresses. Um, and we can use kind of regulation uh, that way uh, without having to do kind of the whole kind of formal KYC. 
Um, and that's kind of like one example. But his idea is that let's kind of have kind of the, the goals that regulators are, are, are going for um, and, and keep them. Like, of course, like you want to uh, protect uh, consumers, uh, you want to avoid people uh, uh, using uh, these exchanges for uh, illegal activities, but let's use the the new tools that technologies uh, this new technology brings us rather than kind of the old method of, of achieving those goals. Well, what they will say is, how are you going to pay for this? Because innovation change that costs money and we don't have any money right now because we've got this infrastructure bill we've got to pay for trillions of dollars. <laughs> Elaine, you had something to say as well, I think. Sorry, Kimmy. I do. I do. I figured out what I wanted to say. The thing is with the DeFi space, um, like I'm just thinking ahead of time for 2022 while all this is, you know, in the works, is that DeFi as um, a sort of banking sort of service is still so very hard to use for so many different people. Like the user experience is still very, very poor. And this is these are not my words. These are coming from people like, you know, the interviews that I've sat on at Real Vision as I'm filming, you know, interview after interview. So uh, I think this one came from Olaf Carlson uh, Wee, who is the CEO of um, cryptocurrency fund Polychain Capital. And he goes just for 2022, the DeFi space is all of just about improving user experience. So we have like, you know, technologies, the people, the brightest minds moving away from working, the biggest technology companies actually moving into DeFi because they know they are, you know, on their way to make a real impact for change uh, for the in, uh, financial institution. But the thing is, it's just for going ahead in 2022, it's all about user experience. And, and I, of course, I agree with him because I think we're going to move on to the Badger DAO hack, which ultimately messed up because of a UI sort of flaw. So I, I think the term is it UI, user experience, is something that the DeFi space really has to clamp down on. You say clamp down on, that sounds like it's, it's problematic. Oh. <laughs> I, I'm uh, going to push back on that. Down on, but, get a, but get a grip on a, a, a little bit better. Because I feel like who do you sort of talk to about this kind of stuff when you have a problem with using the DeFi apps that you're, you know, the multiple wallets that you're trying to work into your everyday life and trying to purchasing whatever you need to purchase within the, the routes of the DeFi applications that you're trying to use? Essentially, I see what we doing talking from, you know, week to week. I see us as the financial service to help people to onboard them into the space. So I'm going to push back on that for, for one simple reason, which is if you spoon feed people too much, they learn nothing. And there's actually some benefit to doing a bit of the work yourself. And if, we, if you want people to understand what decentralization is about, they need to experience the pain of self-custody for themselves. And there's some financial responsibility that comes with that. There is a danger where everything is served up to us in single servings. It's streamed to us. It's easy access on demand that we forget how to think for ourselves. And I, I'm a strong believer in allowing people enough slack to make their own mistakes and learn from them. I agree that that is not a very popular opinion, but I think you can go too far in making things too easy to the extent that people become entitled and they also become lazy. And I don't think decentralization and DeFi should encourage that. I think we should be doing the opposite. I think we should be encouraging people to think for themselves. But I'm curious what you think, Cami. I, I think in in like the middle way between the, the, the two visions, because I think this is a paradigm shift where, you know, people are for the first time having responsibility um, to custody their own funds and information. You know, we're moving from a, a model where we are trusting everything to intermediaries, you know, our assets, our information, everything. Um, and now Web3 and crypto is bringing forth a new model where users are in control. So um, I think that people should should know that they are actually taking on this responsibility and they should learn how to um, how to deal with this and, and, and how to um, how to manage uh, these new tools. And that's why I, I agree with you, Robin, that I don't think Web3 and crypto should be 100% hidden from the UI. 
because this is a, a new system, so people should get used to dealing with new uh, mechanisms and, and, and these new tools. But at the same time, I think there's a lot uh, of education that needs to happen for them to uh, be able to actually kind of um, be able to use these uh, new tools appropriately uh, without losing their funds and without you know uh, terrible things uh, happening um, like, like we've seen. So it's, it's education. It's also you know a UI that that doesn't hide crypto uh, from from users, but that explains and and does do a, a little bit of hand holding along the way. So you know it it could be like. A better kind of um, wallet experience that just like you know kind of ex explains kind of wh what's going on and and um, a, like a better recovery mechanism where you are holding your keys, but something like like Argent does, where you 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 have the possibility of recovering your seed phrase if if you lose it. You know, it's like crypto, but like with with more handrails that we have at the moment. I think is is a better path forward. So, Cami, what we're talking about is things that are very familiar to our Web2 selves, using our phones to interact with financial products um, and, and having UX experiences that are very similar to that. The metaverse, I think, I think will probably end up disrupting all of that in ways that we can't really imagine right now. But it was telling that at the beginning of the week, or the beginning of last week, Adidas showed their hand. They said, we're going into the Adiverse. They partnered up with Board Ape Yacht Club, with G-Money, and with Punk's Comic, and released this slightly crap video of apes in Adidas tracksuits. It doesn't really matter that that wasn't very good, but still, this is a big message from Adidas Originals. They are now represented as a Board Ape. Elaine, did this send shockwaves through your younger self as a clear, uh, as a clear Adidas fanatic, I can see you rocking your Run DMC Adidas. Um, I dig it, man. Like, I totally get like why all these big brands are sort of jumping on the bandwagon, and it's like I see multiple um, Twitter profile uh, ape owners now on their profile uh, page. They still got their ape, but they're wearing like an Adidas jacket. And I'm like, okay, I see why this is an empire that's going to carry on building now. You know, someone said to me uh, last week, which was a really prominent quote in my head, and it was like, look, Elaine, any collection with um, 10,000 items, you can automatically assume it will become a DAO. And I was like, oh, dang. But you know what? I was like, it totally makes sense. I can see why it's, it's going to be current. There's just that whole universe metaverse or whatever that space for you to carry on building with your nfts and that's where it all makes sense to me so i think it's very very cool and very smart of adidas to do so yeah cami this is a different type of onboarding mechanism you know we're talking about apps and people onboarding through apps but they might well onboard through culture and through nfts which is a whole different story which is i guess why we're so metaverse obsessed at the moment but what's your feeling on that I think you know it's it's to me it's not really that surprising to be honest. Like we've we've seen this happening all throughout this year, um, with big celebrities, big names, big brands jumping on the NFT bandwagon. Because I think you know it it it, it sure maybe it's a marketing stunt, but the reason why these people are using um, brands are using NFTs as a marketing stunt is because they've seen um how strongly and how much people have been inspired by this new technology you know i think um this big wave this big nft boom that we've seen this year has come because people outside of the traditional uh, uh spaces uh, that have been attracted to crypto like you know traders speculators uh, you know uh, people into finance um, that's kind of the the, the usual suspects uh, when it comes to kind of the crypto audience this year we've seen a new audience um, and that's coming from from culture from from artists from musicians from influencers um, creators and they've been inspired by the fact that they can now uh, 
own their digital creations. They can monetize it. They can connect directly with their audiences. And this is just hugely empowering uh, for these creators. And now, of course, like brands and, and celebrities and big names are seeing this happen and jumping uh, at the chance to um, you know, be a part of it and benefit from it as well. So, um, you know, Adidas is, is the latest brand we've seen. Well, Dolce & Gabbana announced a, an NFT collection um, before them. Uh, Budweiser uh, released like a like beer can uh, collection. Beer.eth, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's just the latest in a long string of big names, big brands uh, jumping on the NFT bandwagon. And of course, it won't be the last, you know, like I think. It's great. It's great seeing that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. also, um, I'm in Vegas uh, this week. Uh, Real Vision and MGM has got together and we've actually managed to invite Mr. Timberland, um, who is, uh, I don't know, the Timberland, Timberland's Timberland. And uh, he is an ape himself. And also he has basically launched a whole new production house and he is just teaming up with apes to make music. And, you know, all these rights or, or money that will that they'll make I don't know is distributed I don't know the right terms and words for it but these apes are making music next with some of the world's biggest music producers it's Timberland this is Missy Elliott I think this is one of the groundbreaking producers of our time so for him to be jumping onto this an it avid like Adidas wearer yeah and an avid, an avid Adidas wearer the key take out for me from exploring digital fashion particularly I mean I made a film last week about digital fashion and it enabled me to have conversations with really awesome female creators, which is an, uh, unusual for me in this space, which tends to be massively dominated by males. And I know, Elaine, you, you, you take a note of more and more voices from the other yeah. side of the gender spectrum yeah. speaking up and, and making themselves heard. Right. I mean, I noticed um, that video that you produced and it was something really refreshing for me because I was like, oh, that's Robin. I was like, oh, wow, there's like a panel of four women in the space talking about fashion going into Web3. I mean, I, I mean, there's probably no time today, but I would have loved to pick your brains out talking about the key takeaways of that video. But if you're watching, please go on to that video and just watch just basically fashion, the economic empowerment going into fashion was the most refreshing thing for me to see and i think just on my twitter space this week the female flex that i'm seeing and i have to give a huge shout out to my friend at meta zoe who whose real name is zoe davis and i just see her every day popping up my twitter feed and there's just like little pops of tiny little pieces of activism where she's like desperately onboarding women and just getting them to buy nft after nft backed by uh, women, so collection for uh, um, Women Rise, Boss Beauties. And I just see her sort of building this momentum with all the women in the space. And I, I really love seeing that. And I think that's when you mentioned what community that sticks. That's what's really awesome for me. I mean, I, I know <laughs> this week she was like, Elaine, I'm getting my NFT with uh, ENS in real life onto Times Square. And I was like, what the hell are you talking about? But she's putting her little artwork of Frida Kahlo on Times Square with, with the Ethereum name service. And I'm like, Zoe, I have no idea what the hell you're up to, but that Frida Kahlo thing is hers apparently and it's going to be popped up on Times Square and you know, back in the day it was just me and her in an edit bay somewhere but I can't believe she's doing all of this she's she's onboarding groups of women in London taking them to hotels with their laptops and really going right girls we're going to go shopping and this is how you buy an NFT and I think seeing that just warms my heart so much and this is why I love this space so much and I will put in the work in the DeFi space to learn how to you know, get all these, depending on which technology that NFT is built on. Uh, but that sort of momentum gets me going. I really like seeing that. Well, I think I can wrap up the takeout from the digital fashion video very, very simply, which is a few things. Firstly, we've become really accustomed to getting creative items for free. Photos, films, music, it's always been free. Fashion, we still pay for. It still has a value. Secondly, the biggest influencers in the world on Instagram are all women and very fashion conscious. If you think about the ecological impact of fashion on the world, it's staggering. Like 10 to 12% of the world's carbon usage is from fashion, from disposable garments, everything I, as, as well. Digital fashion 
fits into modern social interactions because the way we see most people is through a photograph. It's from an Instagram account or from a TikTok. All of these things can be enhanced digitally in real time. Digital fashion fits in beautifully. The other thing that strikes me is something that Trevor McFedries, who's the creator behind Bill Makeda, said to me. He said, dude, teenage girls, they're going to own, run the world. And I, I've always yes. said, that, I said, that, like, wouldn't it be ironic if this space of ours, which is so male dominated, became completely owned and run really poor by figure. teenage girls? I've read a really poor figure. Only 16% of women make up the NFT space. Wow. It's changing really fast. And I, I think as you add more digital fashion into this, and particularly the ability for just a, a fashion creator to create a single strand or a thread or, or a fabric that can be then reused and, and has royalties attached to it. For me, digital fashion is where NFT has really become mainstream or become a thing that is yeah. just everywhere and a, a beautiful layer on top of just how we interact with the world anyway. I am such a fan of that space and Lovely. who's working there and, and what we can do with it. Camilla, anything else to say? You've been noticeably quiet. Last time we were on a Zoom call together, you and I were perfectly matched. We were wearing exactly the same color scheme. It was shocking. <laughs> Something's gone so, wrong Talking to me about digital fashion, uh, we should have worn our, our matching 80s, 80s colored uh, jumpsuits. <laughs> but I have man, one over there. Probably, by the way. Probably coming. Next time we do one of these, uh, let's set a color. I mean, should we go for some? Should we go for a theme next time? What's yeah, we'll just do Royal now? Tenenbaums. <laughs> Royal Tenenbaums meets The Defiant meets Real Vision. Well, listen, you uh, <laughs> unless you both have anything burning that you need to express to the world via the medium of audiovisual entertainment, I think it's time to wrap it up. And like a fine pair Correct. of Nikes or Adidas, we're going to tie a bow on this. And lock it off because next time we're going to have Mr. Ralph Powell on the show. So which Yay. means that my beautiful English accent is going to be in direct competition with someone of the same ilk. It's been fantastic <laughs> having you, Elaine. Fantastic you having you, Camilla. And we will see you on the very next edition of The Defiant versus Real Vision. <laughs>